Y'all ready for this? Hey, Internet, you have found yourself being brainwashed slowly over millions and millions of nanoseconds by Worldview Everlasting, the showcast pod man, where no one answers the question of the day, but everyone is watching. Watching what, say you? Me voicing my view, vouchsafing of the vows of the Almighty, the vanguard to vanquish all virulent and unfaithful vermin who would do vicious violence to the gospel. Oh, yes, voracious is our volition. Now that we are vivified, voila! Oh, ho, ho. But check it out, it's Greek Tuesday, and I'm going to be parsing and pushing the paradigm of Luke, chapter 9. Just a pinch. But first this. I am hardly going to call myself the next Freedom Watch, but I really couldn't ignore the little tidbits of this video coming out of Dearborn, Michigan. So, we brought a case of copies of the Gospel of John in English and Arabic. I'm going to try standing outside of the festival and handing some of them out. Look at this. Whoa. And having heard on issues, etc., no small number of experts on Islam, the least of which is not Dr. Alvin Schmidt, speaking about Sharia law, I know enough to say this ain't no joke. Of course, another guy I know once said, visionary leadership doesn't try to change the future, it prepares for it. The future is now, people. The world religions are here. My question to you, Christian, is are you going to die on the hill of your free rights to hand out copies of the Gospel of John outside of the Arabic Day Festival? Or are you going to read the Gospel yourself, learn, mark, inwardly digest how it preaches Christ, confess that Gospel to your neighbors, teach that Gospel to your children, and in this confession do you intend to die? I honestly have no clue how fair or accurate AnsweringMuslims.com is, or whether their evangelism techniques and their everyone a minister approach is actually going to help the church or not. But I can tell you that the day is coming when you will either know what you believe and why you believe it, or when these guys rolling 5-0 are going to make that broad and easy road look awful nice. Who has some nasty stuff? And speaking of nasty, what do you make of our Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 9 verses 51 and following? This week's appointed gospel reading. Once again, we're breezing right over the top of a number of events since Jesus kicked the of Legion last week. But imperative to our understanding is a bird's eye view structure of Luke, which flows out of the commissioning of the twelve apostles back in 9 verse 1. See, in Luke there is a clear distinction between an apostle and a disciple. Or to make it sharp and clear, between a pastor and a confessor. Confessors confess. Disciples learn from Jesus and speak his words again. Pastors, those in the apostle sent one office, they confess too, but then they do something else. They are given to speak miracles into being. So Jesus, back in 9 verse 1, has instituted the office of miracle working, what we German Lutherans used to call the predicdomt, and it is distinct over and against general discipleship. And then Jesus immediately goes about explaining how this miracle working works and what it means that he is the Christ of God, namely that he will suffer many things be killed and rise on the third day. Take up your cross, boys, he says, because it's gonna get bumpy. But how can it get bumpy when we've got the power to do miracles? Jesus goes and transfigures himself and then heals a little girl with a demon. This all looks pretty good. It's more of that blessed are they stuff. Listen, Jesus says in 9 verse 43, I'm telling you, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they just don't get it. Who is the greatest among the apostles? They begin to argue. Jesus shushes them all. I sent you to preach. If they listen to you, they're not listening to you, they're listening to me. So quit acting as if it's about you at all, you stupid louts. But master, John says, there was some layman out there. He was confessing your name and miracles were happening. What of it, Jesus says. And then, our text. Luke chapter 9, verse 51 through 62. The days are drawing near for Jesus to be taken up, and he sets his face toward Jerusalem. This is a very peculiar passage and turn of phrase. It's a little awkward, and it's unique enough that it has caused some, among whom is the venerable Arthur Just, to posit that the entire Gospel of Luke hinges on this point. I'm not sure I buy that, but it is big, that's for sure. The days are coming near for Jesus to be crucified. Ascended, yes, but not before first being lifted up like a snake upon a pole. And so he turns his face toward that city that stones the prophets and kills those who are sent to it. And he sends messengers into the villages of Samaria ahead of him as he goes. Get this, does that English ever reek? He apostalens angelus. He apostles 
angels. Now, if you think those are just plain old words, you're not paying attention. He sent his apostles to preach in the town, just as he had commissioned his apostles back in 9 chapter 1 to proclaim the kingdom and to heal. And wherever they are not received, they are, they are to leave that town shaking the dust off their feet as they go. Well, they aren't that well received here. And James and John, the two who we know were at the heart of that whole who's the greatest controversy, want to make like Elijah of old and call down fire out of heaven. Which reminds me, ever since raising of the widow's son at name, the Elijah parallels have been on the increase in Luke. And although this week's Old Testament text of Elijah on Mount Horeb probably fits better with the transfiguration account, you know, still small voice versus this is my son! Listen to him! Even though those texts line up a little bit better than these, there's still Elijah overtones going on all the way throughout this. So James and John are like, let's make like Elijah and slaughter the false prophets. Little Johnny and Jakey want to use their newfound miraculous powers for thunder! Jesus rebukes them. I said shake the dust off your feet. Now, it would be tempting at this point to point out something about how Jesus is being merciful or the like, but slow down, hold your horses. In just about 25 verses, Jesus is going to start breaking out in curses against all the towns that have rejected his preaching by rejecting the apostled preachers he sent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! There's a little bit more going on here than the 21st century be nice morality. They're still walking down the road away from this village and some bloke up and says to Jesus, I will follow you. Follow you wherever you may go. No, you won't, Jesus says. He's a little more enigmatic than that, but that's the gist. Then he turns and says to another guy, You, you there, follow me. But, but, but. No buts, Jesus says. Go confess the kingdom. Yet another pipes up. Ooh, ooh, me, me, choose me. I just need to run back home first and get my special ministry. There is an ocean to be. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. For the office of the ministry? Yes. For the role of disciple and confessor? Yes. To be in the reign of God at all? Yes. To receive forgiveness of sins? Yes. More on that in just one second. What happens next is he appoints 72 more pastors, apostles, preachers, and sends them out to kick demons, forever, forever. heal, and do miracles. All of this foreshadowing the giving of baptism and the Lord's Supper as your miraculous means of grace given by your pastors to you from heaven in the here and now. These early pastors, they get a little high on their horses pretty quick. Hey, the demons listen to us. That's not good news, Jesus says. The good news is that I've chosen you at all. The good news is that your names are written in heaven. And here's where we need to focus in on the gospel in this text. It is way too easy to start moralizing verses 57 to 62 and try to figure out which side of the I will follow you, let me bury my father, let me say farewell, we need to fall on. It's way too easy to start saying, see, they didn't have the right kind of faith. And so you, you go get it. But if you preach like that, you won't be giving faith to anybody. The point of this text is that nobody who's following following Jesus is getting it right. No one. James and John are trying to burn villages full of people, and Jesus won't even let these unnamed radicals tag along for the ride. Why? Because he set his face toward Jerusalem. Because he's fixed like a flint towards being taken up. Because he has a baptism to undergo and he is vexed until that fire is poured out. Because the reign of God is worthy of only one man alone. Where did fire come down out of heaven and burn up all sin? Where were the demons really driven out of the heavens like lightning? Where did the Son of Man finally lay his head? Where did the dead weep, mourn, and wail as they buried their dead? Where did a worker at long last put his hand to the plow and not look back as even Elijah and Elisha had both done? The bloody cross of Jesus Christ. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see there. That's your worldview everlasting. This has been your Greek Tuesday. I didn't have time today, but also, the oldest image of St. Paul was found in a Roman catacomb, proving once and for all that most definitely St. Paul's thorn in his flesh was male pattern baldness. Politics First spins Matt Harrison's quotes to make it look like he supports restructuring, even though he has said he doesn't, in what might be the best constructed, worst construction I have ever seen. And North Korea got their legion handed to them 7-0 in the first game that their government has ever allowed to be televised back home, proving that local sports blackouts are, in fact, the cause of tyranny, totalitarianism, and world hunger.